those joining us from facebook.com and also on our website, www.scotiabg.com. I'm Vanessa Rebo, the Vice President of Sales and Service for Scotia BG Investments. And I have with me here today, Jason Morris, who is our Assistant Vice President for the Development. Also have our Senior Analyst, Natalie Daly, and we have Brian Fraser, our Vice President of Asset Management and General Manager of the SMBG Fund Management. Today we continue our series looking at the Jamaican local economy. Last week we looked at the fiscal situation in Jamaica and also the debt dynamics. And this week we will focus now on investment strategies and the outlook of 2017. So to begin with, we start with Jason Hawkins. Good morning everyone. Since I'll be looking at the strategies, investment strategies for outlook for 2011 by converting what our economic scenarios are into actionable items. So to start with the global backdrop, we are living in a world today where we are seeing improving global corporate profits. If we look at what happened on the US stock exchange and the performance of some of these companies uh, reporting earnings season was very good. Um, but that is being offset by very weak, a very weak labor market where job growth is not, you know, is not forthcoming. And we also see rising political tension in the Arab world, and we have the continuing problem in Europe, where the European sovereign and bank risk is also on the front So I'll go through uh, my explanation and my forecast for 2011. As far as the global economy is concerned, um, the big thing here is that we have a two-speed economic recovery that's going on. We have in the emerging markets where growth is very rampant, China, India, Latin America, and the rest of Asia. However, in the developed world, US, UK, and the Euro era member countries, we have very slow growth and a huge debt problem, something to affect this world. One of the things that has been happening um, is that in the US, the US Federal Reserve back in April, May, June 2010, the US economy was you know, struggling, and what they did was they employed what they call quantitative easing. But what, by quantitative easing, what the Fed has done is it, using its balance sheet to purchase assets. And by buying up assets, it is actually helping to keep US interest rates down one, and that's the intention. But more importantly, for asset prices to rise. So by the Fed coming out and demanding more assets by doing purchases, it has resulted in, in asset prices which is what you would call a kind of reflation. So deflation was occurring where asset prices were falling, and the Fed did not want that to happen, because if you, notice, if you know what is, has been happening in Japan for the past decade, they are living in a system where asset prices have been falling, and that means that when asset prices fall, people do not want to go out and spend. And 70% of the US economy is driven by consumer spending. Therefore, the Fed has been trying to stimulate consumer spending. When you look at the chart, you will see that the Fed has so far been successful in terms of you know, what it, this program has, has done so far as far as quantitative easing is concerned. If you look at the chart that we're showing now, you see where at the start, um, you know, about June 2010, was when there was fear of inflation. And since the Fed started announced QE2, a quantitative easing tool in August 2010, we have seen a rapid increase in global commodity prices. Wheat, grains in general, um, crude oil, um, precious metals, right across the board. However, we have a problem, uh, there could be a problem. Rising global food and commodity prices, while good from the Fed's point of view, is also having a negative impact. Because emerging market economies, which are the ones that have been growing pretty rapidly over the past year and a half, are being affected, negatively affected by a rise in commodity prices. What do I mean by this? Basically, it's causing higher than wanted inflation. So, because we have a two-speed economic recovery ongoing, where emerging market economies are going very rapidly, while the US, Europe, and UK is growing very slowly, higher commodity prices in the US, Europe, and UK is not really a problem. They're not having an inflation problem. However, in developing markets such as Asia, and particular China, where their economy is already doing at 9-10% per, per, on a quarterly basis for us. Higher commodity prices is causing a problem. So what we are seeing is emerging market countries looking to 
hike interest rates. I remember during 2008-2009, we had a reduction in interest rates right across the world because of the global credit crunch. However, what we are seeing now is that in emerging market countries, there is um, a hike in interest rates to, to combat rising food prices, uh, rising inflation. While in the more developed world, such as the US and the UK and the Europe member countries, we are seeing where the central banks want to keep, it, keep interest rates low in order to stimulate the economy. And the problem that we could face you know, another 12, 15 months from now is that emerging market economies, by hiking their interest rates, actually cause a slowdown in global economy growth. While the developed world, which is experiencing slow growth currently, does not grow as fast to offset the decline in emerging market economies. So that's a headwind or a problem that could occur on the horizon. So far, however, the situation has been continuing. Another major key theme from the global perspective is what you call the European credit risk. Now, back in about May, June, we had Greece having to get a bailout from the EU, EU member countries. We also had Ireland getting a bailout last year. Um, and what the EU basically did was to start a, a, a fund that would help countries that are in crisis to sort of bail them out, so to speak, and, and to assist them with financing. Because these countries cannot afford to go to borrow money from the market at very high interest rates, which would only put their debt and fiscal situation in a, in a worse problem. So we have seen where the European Financial Stability Fund was launched back in May last year. And so far in early 2011, it actually issued its first bond. What's the importance of this? Well, it's important, it's important in terms of allowing countries who have a problem accessing the debt market, finding a way to access cheaper capital, as well as trying to put some confidence in the marketplace to say, um, Europe will not allow the weaker economies to fall. So that's, that's been a, a sort of a positive. The drawback, however, is that providing funding or money or cash to countries that have severe debt problems does not solve the fundamental question that the market is asking. What is the fundamental question? Are the economies solvent? In other words, no matter how much money you throw at the problem, uh, money cannot solve solvency issues. So if you throw money at a, at a problem where what's the real problem is that the economy need to grow, then money alone won't cause the economy to grow. So if you look at the graph that we have up there, we will recognize that after the European Financial Stability Fund was formulated back in May 2010, credit spreads are the risk that markets attach to purchasing insurance for you know, each dollar outstanding bond has actually increased. So before you had the European Financial Stability Fund forming, markets were you know, thinking that Greece was going to default. Then Greece got a bailout, the markets thought that Ireland was going to default, Ireland got a bailout. And so what the market is doing is moving from one service to the next. Next on the, on the chart is Portugal. But so far, you know, their credit spreads are actually very high and they are facing a difficult situation. So what the market will come, the question that the market will continue to ask until something fundamentally has changed is will these countries be solved? And the market is at the moment pricing a very high probability that one of these Europe member area countries will have to restructure their day. And that's the reason why credit spreads are so high. So that's something that we need to keep our fingers on, and that's a threat, potential threat to global economy. So if we look at the EU situation um, a bit deeper, if we look at the graph that we now have, it is showing you the difference between the risk of the US banks and the risk of EU member country banks. So if you look at all the banks together and look at the risk, which is what the credit spread is measuring, you realize that basically US banks and European banks we're tracking each other pretty consistently over the past year and a half. However, back in May, June of 2010, we saw a divergence begin to occur. What was the divergence? We begin to see whereby European bank credit spreads have actually widened out or increased significantly. The higher the credit spread, the higher the risk that the market is putting on some problem occurring in terms of you know, banks facing serious problems and probably neither being available. Why is this significant to us? It's significant to us because one, a lot of EU member country banks or financial institutions are highly exposed to some of those problem sovereigns, 
So for example, a lot of EU member countries are highly exposed to Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, and Spain. Which means that if any of these sovereigns were to restructure their debt, it means that these banks would have a significant problem because if the, if the sovereign were to restructure, the bank would run into serious sovereignty problems and would need to be restructured. Um, the flip side also is that a lot of these banks are actually weak. They are highly leveraged. Their profitability is not as strong as US banks. Their non performing loan ratios are also not as good as, U as US banks. And that's also contributing to the reason why the risk of these EU member country banks are actually increasing. So the question here is given the fact that we know that US banks versus U EU banks use trade at a much closer spread, will Will we see a, a, resum a, a resumption to what was now? By, by that I mean, will we see EU member country banks spread narrowing to US banks? And that could present an opportunity. But it may also show that the market has been looking forward and has good foresight and showing that these problems are not going away, are not going to go away in the near term. And so this is something that is presents an opportunity, but it's also a huge risk. Now moving to emerging market credit spreads. So coming out of what we are seeing where we have the two-speed global economy where emerging markets have been outperforming. And what happened in 2010 was because emerging market fundamentals for the first time in you know, many a crisis, so if we go back over the last 100 years, for example, it used to be that when the developed world was in a problem, emerging markets used to be in a worse problem. So the idea is that when you, you, the, the developed markets caught a cold, emerging, mar emerging markets used to get significant um, headaches. Right now, what we have seen is that emerging market countries are actually much stronger fundamentally. They have very strong balance sheet, external um, balance sheet in terms of you know, their exports, very strong, and therefore their net international reserves are also very strong. And the domestic demand is also very strong. And what we saw in 2010, was that money flowed out of the developed countries such as the US, UK, and Europe, and went into emerging market countries such as Brazil, many Latin American countries, and Asia. And therefore, that's the reason why the yields or the, or the credit spread on emerging market bonds have declined. However, if you look at the chart that we have up, these are, are very close to where they were pre crisis. So in 2007 going into 2008, these were at record lows. And then we had a credit crisis occurring. And what we are seeing now is that emerging market yields are actually approaching those levels. And because you mentioned the fact that emerging market countries are now faced with an inflation problem, and they are looking to hike interest rates, and therefore that could slow down their economic growth, then we think that at these levels, there's a risk of reversal. There's a risk that we could have a sell off in emerging market credits. Um, nevertheless, we still think that emerging markets are going to outperform and continue to perform strongly, fundamentally. However, one, if some of the problems that we explained just now with developed markets actually go away or are contained, then some of that hot money that flowed into emerging market uh, countries could actually reverse and start going back, for example, the US um, in particular, which has been doing a bit better than 